Well, we might get underway. I suspect there might be one or two will drift in, but let's let's just get underway and get get started. Um, so this is the third in the series of this program, um, uh, which we're doing partly for our own sake and partly as a to create a resource that might be useful for people that at any time in the year are thinking about church membership, and they can go back and look at these videos, and there'll be a little sort of mini program waiting for them. So first week we looked at Anglicanism, as it were, what it means to be an Anglican kind of Christian. Last week we looked at um, discipleship, being disciples of Jesus, where does the significance of Jesus within our kind of faith. This week we're going to talk about the Bible, which I, as I said in church, in one sense it's the easiest one for me to talk about, but it's also the hardest one to talk about because what do you, what do you say if you just want to give a kind of a heads up about the Bible? Then we have a couple of weeks break. We'll do one on prayer, spiritual practice. We'll do one on the mission of the church. And then we'll do another one about um, shaping our lives intentionally around, around the, the faith that we have as Christians. So uh, starting with the Bible. And um, um, this is really, a, I mean, we've, already, we've had a number of sessions already in the Dean's Forum where we've looked at scripture. But this is a, this is what we're going to try and do today is just talk much more succinctly in you know 45 50 minutes or so what can we usefully say about the Bible to give people a kind of orientation to the role of Scripture within their lives. So I've, what I've chosen to do is to pick on so a number of kind of trajectories that I think we might usefully focus on. So I want to think about I want to spend five six minutes or so talking about the people of the book uh, as one of the ways of approaching scripture. Then I want to talk about uh, the idea of sacred texts because obviously the Bible is sacred text for Christians. So we we'll spend six, seven minutes so talking about that. Then I want to say a little bit about the making of books which is uh, at risk of becoming a lost art because of digital technologies. But before we get too upset about computers replacing books, remember the books replace scrolls and scrolls replace storytellers. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a progress, progression going on here. But I think if we're really going to understand the significance of scripture and the way that it works and has worked for people, then we need to also pay attention to just what a book is because obviously the, for most of the last two to two and a half thousand years, uh, the Bible has been a book. But that reflects a culture where books are important. What if we're in a culture where books are not important? Whether that be a tribe in Papua New Guinea or um, uh, what's becoming of the Western world where people, you go to libraries and they're, in order to survive, libraries have to provide other services than books mm. because books are not as you know, popular as they once were. And then I want to talk a little bit about, again, spend six, eight minutes or so talking about the dynamics of Scripture um, and, and how Scripture actually works in our lives. I figured if we've done that, we've probably done okay. So I'm going to start off by giving um, some images of how the, the Bible has looked different at different points in history. So this is the opening part of the, the great scroll of Isaiah from the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> um, and we're just looking at columns one, two, three, four. Obviously, if you go to the um, Israel Museum website, you can, you can bring up this image and by clicking with your mouse at different bits, you're in effect unrolling the scroll. You're going to see different bits of the scroll. Now, of course, we use that metaphor, don't we, when we say we're scrolling through a document, we're scrolling down the screen. We've actually taken the language of the ancient scrolls. Here you can see the scroll is rolled up and the first few columns are out flat. And you can also see that it's been damaged but I was sitting in a cave in an earthenware jar about oh, a little bit higher than my knee for the best part of 2,000 years with no um, 
no sort of curator looking after it. It was just sitting in an earthenware jar in a cave by the Dead Sea, which thankfully is a very dry environment with no humidity. Even so, the scroll has been damaged, and so there are going to be some lines where there are going to be gaps in the scroll. So, um, this reminds us that the earliest copies of the Bible were hand copies. There was no mechanization. We're long before the printing press. Um, this is obviously a trained scribe who's done this. It's very beautiful writing. I mean, it's very uniform. Somebody is a well-trained, who, who has made this scroll is a well-trained scribe, very disciplined art. Um, and of course, it's in Hebrew, not English. Is Hebrew a language? Yes. Yes, Hebrew is the language. Right. Hebrew is the language of the Jewish people. Is it still spoken? It is now. It wasn't spoken for the best part of 2,000 years, but as part of recreating Israel, um, beginning in the 1920s, a guy called Ben Yehuda, which means son of Judah, but that was his name, he actually he brought Hebrew back to life as a spoken language. So modern, what's called modern Hebrew is not actually ancient Hebrew, but the alphabet is the same. And of course, modern Hebrew is, is partly Hebrew, Bible Hebrew, um, but there are a lot of things happened in the last 2,000 years for which the Bible had no words. So they had to, had to find new words. Well, they took those words from Yiddish, which was the language that Jewish people in Germany and Russia spoke. Eastern European Jews spoke Yiddish words like chutzpah and so on, um, yada, 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 and so on. And um, they also borrowed a lot from Arabic, because Arabic is the nearest living language to ancient Hebrew. And many of the words are the same, um, uh, with, with some predictable differences. So a word that might have a sh sound in Hebrew will often have a s sound in Arabic. But once you know those patterns, it's not too hard to work out what's going on. And I'm, I've, I've, I've studied Hebrew in the past. I'm now learning Arabic. And um, one of the things I occasionally find is I'll be asked a question I'm expected to answer in Arabic, but from somewhere deep in my recesses, the answer will come out in Hebrew because they're so similar. It's like, it's like English and German or at, in certain parts. So yes, this reminds us not only that the earliest phase of the Bible was not a printed book, but, uh, but also it wasn't, it wasn't English, it wasn't even a European language. So we're dealing with an ancient Oriental text. It comes from another culture, another time, another language. But around the conventions of this kind of manuscript, around this sort of manuscript, are lots of conventions. I mean, you didn't just pick up a pen and start writing. Okay? Yeah, someone who's doing this is a very highly trained scribe. And these kind of scrolls are very expensive to make. You'd pay someone a year's salary to make a copy of a scroll this big. That's like you know, what a sixty to one hundred thousand dollar cost for a book. Was it just like ink? Equivalent to ink? Yes, ink, but ink on parchment. Yeah. Um, and also ink on uh, ink on. Um, ink on vellum when you get to the Middle Ages. So some of, the, some of it is paper and some of it is animal skin. So the, 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 there were different writing materials and, and there were all kinds, we'll talk about that in a moment in terms of literature, but um, just as we can go into the news agent, you can buy for your school kids you know, a 24 page exercise book or a 48 page exercise book or a 96 page exercise book. We go to the stationer in the ancient world and you'd buy a piece of parchment of varying standard lengths um, and and so if if you needed to combine a, a number of pieces to make a really big scroll well then you get a join like you've got here so the document has been joined to make a really long piece of parchment so that's that's one of the earliest examples of the bible um, and it's from the dead sea scrolls which were found in 1948 but it actually comes from around about 150 BC, something like that. This is what's called, and listen to the words, Codex Sinaiticus. 
So now we've moved from scroll to codex, from scroll to book. But you notice, even though it's a book, it's still in the columns. I find me touching the screen. It's still in the columns as if it was a scroll. Because all they've done is they've taken the scroll and they've chopped it into chunks. Every four columns, whoosh, chop it off. Stack them up on top of each other, stitch the edge. Look, Mum, I just invented the codex. Okay, But it still had to look like a scroll. Otherwise, people would say, well, it doesn't look like a proper book. Okay, Now, that's why if we get an encyclopedia or a dictionary, it's still in columns. A reference work is in columns. A recreational book, the lines go all the way across the page. It goes right back to the fact that ancient scrolls were written on a man's thigh. So the column was about three inches in the old language wide because that, that was your portable writing and reading desk. Okay, So uh, even when the book was invented, it still had to look like a scroll. Now when we get to the printed books, so in the next one, this, now we're down to the Middle Ages. This is Psalm 27, um, and it's an example of a beautifully illuminated, handmade book. So the text is beautifully written. I mean, this sort of script is really, really beautifully written. Probably the notations are probably to tell people how to sing it. Um, you've got the sort of capital in the first word being particularly illuminated. And then you've got a facing page, which is meant to tell the reader something about what's going on in the text. Beautiful. And again, um, who can afford something like this? Not your peasant. Okay. So these, this is very expensive. Sorry? This would be in vellum. And um, again, would take, I mean, one set of craftsmen would create the vellum. Another set of craftsmen would do the text. A third set of craftsmen would do the illuminations. So that's a massive investment. And, and these are only for the rich and famous, rich and powerful. The average Christian, prior to the invention of the printing press, would never have seen a Bible. So all this talk about how important the Bible is, well, yes, but no one ever saw one. And even if they saw one in church, they would never have owned one. And even if they somehow got a copy of the Bible, they couldn't have read it because they weren't educated. They weren't literate, which is why the stories of the Bible went into the stained glass windows, okay, because that they could read, go to commas. Okay. And then we get the first, this is a page from Martin Luther's uh, first edition printed German Bible. Actually, it's sitting in my spare study down in the deanery, a particular artifact. Okay, so it's, um, so now we're getting printing press and again you're still getting a sense they still want to decorate the capital and, and and there are other pages that have illustrations but they're basically going to be black and white because it, it's, it's going to be a, if you're going to mass produce a book to then have it hand colored almost defeats the purpose of having a mass produced book which is what the printing press allows so this is a German Bible so not only is it a printed Bible but it's in the vernacular. It's no longer in Hebrew or Greek. It's no longer even in Latin. So it's, notice something really important is happening at the Reformation. The idea is we've got to get the Bible into the language that people actually speak. Because it always had been, but there was a time lag through the Middle Ages. People stopped speaking Greek and didn't really speak Latin anymore. So the idea said, so what Luther was doing was nothing new, except that nobody had done it since St. Jerome at the end of the 4th century. So there's about 1,100 years or so where nobody had updated the language of the Bible to be the language that the local people actually spoke. And because it was a horrific idea at the time, from some people's perspective. Okay? And yet it was actually what the reason that there's a Latin Vulgate because the Pope said um, way back in the late 300s, um, the people in the western part of the empire don't speak Greek. 
we need to have a version of the Bible in Latin, hence the Latin Vulgate, the, the Latin tongue, the language, the, the everyday language. So that's German, and we, we understand that's Luke, um, Gospel of Luke and so on. This is actually the King James Bible as it looked in 1611. And we can barely read it, but that's English. Okay, what most what most people think of as the King James Bible is a modernization of the authorized version that happened in the middle of the 19th century when they swapped from Gothic script to more contemporary script. This is much more like the German Bible. It's Gothic. So English was Gothic. So, um, so this is in fact from Genesis, and he's been so that's an S, and that's an S in Oldie English. Okay, so and you can see we, we would we would need some time to let our eyes adjust to that, and then we could sort of make sense of it. Okay, but you can see why in the middle of the nineteenth century they said, "Oh, this is all too hard." Let's switch to the more contemporary font, which is what you get in a more recent kind of study Bible. And of course, these days you're just as likely to read the Bible on your iPad as in a as in a physical book. Ha! Huh. Sitting over here with his iPad going. Okay, yes. not necessarily reading the Bible, but, but <laughs> and it's in my case, what I pulled up was I've got the NRSV here. And I told the iPad to split the screen, and I've got the Greek Old New Testament on the facing page. And as I scroll down this page on my iPad, the Greek will scroll down simultaneously. Or if I, uh, and, and there are various ways that I can look up the Greek word that's behind the English word, and so on. So the the technology and the cultural and social dynamics around the text have clearly changed over time. You might, you might or may not have noticed that when Paul goes to quote from the Old Testament, he never says, uh, in Deuteronomy 6.23, he'll say something like, it says somewhere. Because there was no way of, there were no chapters and verses in the first century. There was no way of referring. You had to say, in that bit of the Bible that talks about, you know, mm -hmm. because things we take for granted hadn't yet developed. So that's the book, and it's developed over the, over the millennia. So let's, let's play with this idea of the people of the book. One of the ways of talking about Christians, but also Jewish people and Muslims, and actually it comes out of the Quran. Um, in the Quran, the prophet Muhammad is told that Christians and Jews are to be treated um, respectfully and not like pagans because they are people of the book. So this phrase, the people in the book, is actually a Muslim way of talking about Jews and Christians. Not many Christians realise that when they say, oh, we're the people of the book. Well, that's the name Muhammad gave us. And so it's interesting how that has kind of got lost in the transition. What it's doing, of course, it's saying the religions of Judaism and of Christianity and of Islam, one of their characteristic and distinctive elements is the way that a sacred book functions within the religion rather than the way priests operate or the way sacrifice happens or pilgrimage or whatever the almost the defining attribute that's a bit overstating it of these religions is that they they not only have a sacred text but the three sacred texts are kind of connected at some level and in the detail of course there's a whole lot of religious and other disputes. So one of the ways of describing Christians is to say we are the people of the book. We get, you know, inverted commas, we get our religion out of the book. As I've just been hinting, the, f the fact that we have a special role for a book in our religion in a way that's not true for Buddhists or not true for Hindus, for example, um, that also points to an interfaith dynamic between Christians and Jews, which we tend to be much more comfortable with than the Jewish people are. Not surprising, because they've been on the losing side of that deal for the last 2,000 years. And similarly, there's a relationship 
between Jews and Christians on one hand and Islam and the Quran, but just as Jewish people don't like what we've done to their Bible, we don't like what Muslims have done to our Bible. Mm. Okay, so there is an interfaith element to it, but it's a it's problematic. It's not just a, it's not a happy, smooth, everything's hunky dory in the garden. Um, so scripture does function in a very unique, a special way for Jews, Christians and Muslims, but it does so very differently. Jewish people are not as hung up about the Bible as we are. They're much more relaxed about where well, everybody has to decide for themselves. You read the Bible, but then end of the day, you've got to decide for yourselves. And in particular, Jewish, if, somebody, if a Jewish person is very devout, they're going to read the Talmud rather than the Bible. And the Talmud is a, is a collection of several hundred years of scholarly wisdom around the biblical text. So in the middle of the page, there'll be like a paragraph from the Bible, and then around that will be the commentary by different scholars. And they're reading all of that. They're not just reading the bit in the middle. Okay? Christians have tended to say, particularly since the Reformation in the West, that we've, we've got to read the Bible rather than listen to the Pope or listen to the priest or whatever. And of course for Muslims, the, um, uh, the Quran is, is absolutely uh, fundamentally important. But uh, whereas Jews and Christians will see the Bible as being written by humans, Muslims believe that the Quran is dictated by God, literally dictated, and Muhammad had to memorize it and then other people copied it down after Muhammad performed it. Um, and indeed the word Quran is related to the Hebrew word for recite or to read. And it means, so it's the capturing of an oral performance of the word of God. And Muslims would say, unlike the Jewish Bible, unlike the Christian Bible, they would say that the Quran is absolutely error free. And unlike most Christians and most Jews, there is no scope in Islam for textual criticism. You, you can't have a critical attitude to the text. You know, it's just that that's how the Quran has been. It's always been that way. There's no such thing as variation over time. Now, in fact, there is, but that's a very tricky area for Muslims. So, um, so in a sense, for Muslims, the Quran is the incarnation of the Word of God. Whereas for Christians, Jesus is the incarnation of the Word of God. So the Quran functions for Muslims rather like Jesus, in some respects, functions for Christians. So we're people of the book, and that we do have something in common. We're all part of the one big tribe at one level, but there are very significant differences between us. So the fact that we might happily accept the um, Islamic designation of us as people of the book, um, it actually reminds us that we need to kind of uh, have a, a much more open attitude to both Jews and Muslims than some Christians are inclined to have. Because so much of the stories in the Quran are of course, a, um, from our perspective, a Muslim retelling of the stories in the Bible. It's much shorter, it's a very, very tiny little, just as the New Testament is much more shorter than the Old Testament, the Quran is much shorter than the New Testament. Mm. Okay? So that's interesting as well. The texts become more condensed, shorter, rather than expansive. Now tied up with all of this is, is the concept of the word of the Lord. So in church this morning, Kay finished her reading and she said, hear the word of the Lord. Okay. She didn't say that was the word of God, although some people might have thought that's what she meant. Okay, we say either you know, hear the word of the Lord or for the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. So we'll come back to that towards the end because the idea is that in some sense, the biblical text is, a, is an iteration of the word of the Lord, which is not the same as word of God, although they're related. 
Okay, so any any kind of comments before we move on to um, sort of canon? So the, the idea that there's a, a book and where in the case of Judaism, the book emerges over time. Christianity, of course, began with the, the Bible already there and we added to it. The Christians, the first Christians already had the Old Testament. The first Jews didn't have the Bible. The Bible kind of grew out of their experience. And similarly, the first Muslims um, knew that Christians and Jews had holy books, and so it wasn't going to be a surprise if their prophet generates a holy book. Okay, But that's actually a pretty, it's a big idea. It's a new idea, the idea of having a holy book. Okay. I'm very ignorant on this, but all around in the same chronological era, no, no. So, um, okay. And this is a nice segue then to how we get these books. In the case of the Jewish people, you know, the Old Testament story purports to be the 2,000 plus years prior to Jesus. There's nothing from the time of Jesus onwards in the Jewish scriptures. It's all prior to Jesus. Um, now, um, if you read the Old Testament stories and so on, you're going to date Moses around about, very rough terms, around about 1500, 1400, something like that. You're going to date Abraham around about 2000. You're going to date David and Solomon around about 1000 BC. So this is, these are, but as we'll see in a moment, that's not necessarily when the books were created, but that's the timeline of the characters. Like if I write a story about Robert Hood, I put it in the time of Richard the Lionheart but I'm writing it in 2018. I don't live in the time of Richard the Lionheart. Okay, I'm not that old. Um, the Christian period obviously starts with Jesus and um, all of the New Testament is going to be written within about 100 years of Easter. And some people would say much quicker. I think they're dreaming. But uh, I, I would say certainly by the time you get to the middle of the second century, everything we have in the New Testament is created. doesn't mean that it's yet scripture, but I think it exists. Now, in the case of Islam, um, you're dealing with um, um, the, the Muhammad's first visions as something like 620 AD. So there's about, there's roughly, there's just, there's roughly 600 years between Jesus and Muhammad. And, and the Quran comes out of his lifetime, but was not written down during his lifetime. It was an oral tradition where Muhammad performed it, recited it, and other people started memorizing it. It was only after Muhammad died that they said, we better write this down. And, and then of course you've got the question of quality control now, the Muslim answer is, well, God guided the people who were making the one copy of the Quran. There were never any variants. But you see what they're doing. They're trying to say the miracle of the Quran validates the authority of the text. There are similar uh, legends about the creation of the Old Testament and so on. So, the, so it's basically, for one of a <coughs> rough terminology, you could probably date the beginnings of the Old Testament as scripture around about 500 BC. The New Testament is in the first century and the Quran is in the seventh century. So basically 500 year, a rolling series of 500 years. That's grossly oversimplified, but that's a framework. So what's a sacred scripture? Well, sacred scripture is any text that a particular religious community recognizes as sacred. So if you're a Mormon, the Book of Mormon is your sacred text. And the rest of us say, that's a heap of rubbish. That's not a sacred text. And so on. So you can see, the, so the status as a sacred text depends on there being a group of people who say, you're special. You're my holy book. This is my holy book. Okay. Now, in the case of the Bible, we have the Jewish, what we call the Jewish Bible. That's not what Jews call it. That's our language. Okay? The Jews will, again, the concept of Bible is not so central to Judaism as it is for Christians. So, so we've, we've exported our idea of Bible and applied it to the Jewish scriptures. 
Um, so one of the words that Jewish people use is Tanakh, T-A-N-A-K, because that's an acronym for Torah, uh, Torah, uh, Nevi'im, and Kethuvim, which is the law, the prophets, and the writings. So Tanakh is a Jewish acronym meaning the law, the prophets, and the writings. Uh, it's also called Mikra, which is a Jewish word meaning, a Hebrew word, sorry, <laughs> meaning scripture or written. And Mikra, the Q and the R and the A in Mikra are the same letters as in the Quran. Because these languages, Arabic and Hebrew, are so close together. Um, so, so the Jewish Bible are those sacred texts which emerge in the Jewish um, national and religious communities, but certainly by the end of the Persian period before the time of Alexander the Great. Okay. Now, exactly what status they had is unclear. But they were beginning to become, if you were Jewish, you knew these texts. They were beginning to emerge. For the Christian Bible, for the Christians, you had the Jewish sacred text, text and Paul will refer to them simply as the writings, the graphi, the scriptures say, the writings say. There was no kind of official word for these group of texts. Um, and the Christians add to it the Gospels, and they also add to it the, particularly the letters of Paul and some of the other apostles, and then they add to it um, the book of Revelation to create a, body, a Christian Bible, which is both the Jewish sacred texts right down into the Hellenistic period, including um, what we call the Apocrypha, which were texts in the, Hebrew, in the Greek Bible, but not the Hebrew version of the Bible. And then there are other Christian books added to that. So this um, Sinaiticus that we had a photo of before, that's the earliest surviving copy of the Bible, Christian Bible, and it has in it the Old Testament, but not the Hebrew Old Testament, it's in Greek. And it includes books which we call the Apocrypha, which were not in the, had never been in the Jewish Bible. But the Jewish text written in Greek. So they never quite got the status of the Jewish books written in Hebrew. But you can see what was happening. In the Hellenistic period, most Jews didn't speak Hebrew. So the Bible gets translated into Greek and it keeps on growing in Greek. Later on, the Jewish people say, no, only the only the books which were composed in Hebrew at Honkidori. And of course for Islam, it's a totally, the, the uh, status of, of the Quran as scripture is um, unique. But then within Christian Bibles, we have Catholic Bibles and Orthodox Bibles and Anglican Bibles, Protestant Bibles, Armenian Bibles and so on. And it's not just language here. Um, most of the books are the same, but there's a small number of books that differ from one Bible to another. So for instance, in our lectionary in the Anglican Church, we will read from the Apocrypha. It's set as the Bible reading for morning and evening prayer. And at the end of the reading, we say, hear the word of the Lord. Whenever I'm giving a Bible to someone, I always give them a proper Bible <laughs> that includes the Apocrypha. Because that's, that's the Anglican Bible. That's what the articles say. We, we have a, a, a little book of readings for each day of the week, published by the Anglican Church of Australia, has readings from Maccabees, has readings from the Wisdom of Solomon, has readings from Judith, and so on. In other words, we, we read these things in church, and at the end of the reading we say, for the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. We don't use them to establish beliefs, but we read them for the other reason. There's more to the Bible than establishing doctrine. But if, you, if your view of, scripture, of Christianity is it's all about beliefs, well, then you have a very narrow Bible as well. Okay? All right, we've probably had our five minutes on this screen. Let's quickly see what else. Okay. So, well, I've just been saying some of this. So, these texts, in other words, the texts that we are calling scripture are the texts which are authorised for reading in church. It's not authorised to read in church a text from the prophet Kahil Gilbran, the sort of Lebanese uh, Baha'i or Muslim spiritual writer. Very popular at weddings, 
but it's not authorized as a sacred text to be read in church. Okay? It's not part of the Bible. So texts from the Bible will be authorized, including the Apocrypha. There are also texts which are consulted to settle theological disputes, but as we know, often the theological dispute is not dealt with in the Bible, like same-sex marriage. The Bible will tell you how to arrange, say, polygamy, because polygamy was a big deal in the ancient world and was perfectly okay. But the Bible won't tell you what to do about same-sex marriage because same-sex marriage didn't, wasn't an issue 1000 BC or 500 AD. So it's not, not every theological or whether to ordain women as priests. You won't find anything in the Bible because actually the Bible doesn't talk about priests, as in Christian priests. That developed later on. Okay, So you can see some of the differences here. So what happens is we end up with our own private set, probably largely determined by your parish priest, of the text that we all agree to pay attention to, and the text we tend to all agree, we're just going to ignore that bit. Because we never read it. Like Leviticus. Okay, We're not going to run a Bible study on Leviticus and so on. We're not going to say, well, I'm not going to wear a mixture of rayon and whatever, because Leviticus says I can't mix different kinds of cloth. Okay? But some Christians will. That's why Jehovah's Witness won't have blood transfusions because Leviticus says you can't drink blood and so having a blood transfusion must be the same as drinking blood. Well, not really, but you can see kind of where things go, go a bit pear-shaped. All right? <laughs> I'm, I'm probably opening up more questions than I'm answering, but that's fine. Okay. So scripture, sacred scripture, is effectively these are the documents that people say we value these documents and we pay attention to them. Now around that they wrap a whole lot of legends, like God wrote these books, they dropped out of heaven, you know, an angel leant over Paul's shoulder, no, don't use that word, use this word. That's all nonsense. This is devotional, pious legends developing later on. So let's come back down to practical things, how books get written. So there's a whole lecture there in one line. <laughs> books are technical, they're cultural items which are generated in particular social contexts using particular technologies. And if you haven't yet invented the alphabet, which was the case for everywhere in the world prior to about uh, 1700 BC, when somebody in what we call Lebanon or northern Israel invented the alphabet, then you don't have words that are spelt using letters. You have hieroglyphics, and you have cuneiform, little triangular shapes, like almost like a Morse code. Okay, and uh, and if you don't have a, if you don't have a way of producing paper, then you're going to make mud tablets, or even stone tablets. But they're really inconvenient to carry around. Okay. So the time that Moses is portrayed as going through the wilderness with two million um, Hebrew slaves, um, they didn't have paper and they didn't have the alphabet. He would have needed dozens of ox carts to carry the stone tablets with the books of Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers. Okay, so it's, it's a nonsense. It's just not something that ever could have happened in the ancient world. The other thing is you only invested in teaching people to read and write if there was an economic value in doing so. So you want your tax collectors to be able to count, and you want accountants, they've got to be able to count, and, and so on. You want your priests to be able to observe stars and calculate the seasons, okay? And, and if you're in trade, then you're probably wanting to keep lists of what you purchased, who you got it from, how much they charged you, and all that sort of thing. But if you're Farmer Joe up in the valley in Galilee or something, you have no use for reading and writing. Everything you need to know, you remember in your head. Or you put big lumps of stone in the ground to say, this is my paddock and that's your paddock and don't you shift this stone. <laughs> the marker stone. Don't shift the boundary stone. Because there's no drawings, there's no maps, there's no title deeds. 
Up, this rock's been here since my granddad's time, and don't you shift it. Okay? So you're only going to have literature when you have a rich, highly centralised society which is generating a surplus which is enjoyed by the rich and powerful and that's when you that's when you have musicians that's when you have people writing the legends of the ancestors down creating drama creating literature culture of that kind is going to flourish when you have a successful centralized hierarchical economy or society okay and where you've got you're making so much surplus that you can afford to have some of the boys siphoned off to learn to read and write instead of growing crops. So until then, you don't waste education on anybody. You get them in the field, keeping the farm going. So as soon as you think about books and literature emerging, as distinct from oral ballads, you've got you in a different culture. You're in a centralised culture. So so, and of course they don't stop telling. They don't stop singing the ballads just because somebody in Jerusalem is learning to read and write. So now you're going to have parallel transmissions. The stories are going to keep going and be remembered and sung and celebrated, set to music. And at the same time, uh, powerful people are going to say, now I want you to write the story down and tell the story in such a way that everybody can see I'm in charge because God has chosen me to be in charge. And if you don't write it that way, not only will I not pay you, but I will chop your head off. Okay? That's the patronage of the literary arts. Okay. And many of the texts in the Bible were created in order to express a point of view about what, what happened to Jerusalem, how come it was captured by the Babylonians, why should the sons of David always be the ones who get picked to be kings of Israel, and so on. And who's paying for why is the story being told that way? Then you get something else happening, and particularly in the Assyrian period, not Syria, but Assyria. Uh, the Syrians were particularly mean and uh, violent, but highly successful um, empire for a couple of hundred years. And they came up with the idea that when I conquer your city, we sign a covenant with you. And and it's agreement between me and you, but also between my God and your God. And we'll agree what the terms of the covenant are. And we'll write those things in the covenant text. And we'll put a copy of that document in your temple and in my temple. And if you step out of line, we can go back and I will have a reason to come and destroy your city because your own document says mm -hmm. I'm going to pay so much tribute every year. I'll be loyal to my suzerain. I won't. I won't make an alliance with Egypt because I'm always going to be true to the wonderful king. My father, the king of Assyria, and I will be a son to him. He will be a father to me. All this language we get out of the covenant traditions in the Bible. What year was the Assyrian king? Um, basically from the uh, early... Well, um, got to think backwards. So high 700s down and they finally have wiped out around about 609 BC. And that's, that's exactly a time when a lot of the biblical traditions from Jerusalem seem to be being crafted and they appear to be influenced by the Assyrian um, sort of treaty genre, as it were. Because then the idea is, well, there's a covenant not just with the king of Assyria, but there's a covenant with God. And God's terms of the covenant are in the book and the book is in the temple, and the priest will read it to you. And the Bible is invented in that moment. Okay? And the document takes on that set of words. So it's, there's a certain social and technological things have to happen. Um, certain political things have to happen. But also there's a change in the technology as you go from scrolls to parchment uh, to codex. And then eventually printed books and on, of course, to digital is books. Good? Yeah. What is codex? Codex, it means book. Codex book? So a scroll, yeah. is, a scroll is a long piece of paper. Well, it can be one sheet or it can be 24 metres long. A book is where you chop up the scroll into leaves 
stack them on top of each other, stitch the edge, you've then got a codex. It's just a, it's just an, it's the old Latin word for book. Well, I've never encountered that word. Before. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about codifying something, codifying something, we're putting it in a book. Yeah. Okay. So, but but that's that again. It, it reflects the the book becomes a symbol. So people will talk about the the Bible for Mac users or the Bible for motorcycle. They don't mean the Bible. They mean a book which gives you all the answers you need to being able to maintain your motorbike or to use your Apple Mac computer or or the fisherman's Bible is not a whole lot of Bible verses about going fishing. Fisherman's Bible is how to read the tides, where to find the best fishing spots and so on. So, so the, even the idea of a Bible has become a book of expert knowledge. <coughs> so it's, it's changed over time. And then in amongst all of this is this other wild card running through, which is how much could people read and write at different times in history? We, we take it for granted that almost everybody who turns up at the cathedral can read and write. Okay? Unless they're really, really tiny children. But we actually know that functionally, even in our culture, some people are illiterate. Okay? But in earlier times, most in antiquity, even if you could read, you couldn't necessarily write. They were very different skills. Like, the fact that you could read a type letter is not the same as knowing how to use a typewriter. Although Keyboard literacy, interesting phrase, has become normal in our culture. Because the keyboard is the data entry tool for digital technology. Okay? So in the ancient world, even though we find it shocking, Jesus was probably illiterate. Because there's no reason for a little farming village in Nazareth to invest in education for farm boys. Herod's son, sure, they went to school. Well, they had a tutor. There were no schools. I mean, there were the Greek gymnasium, but that's not going to be found in Nazareth. So the rich and powerful sent their kids to the gymnasium where they were given lessons in life, okay, but didn't necessarily learn how to write. That was a specialised skill. You, you, didn't, you didn't need to write or even read because you can buy a slave to do that. Okay. It's like, I don't have to understand my tax return, I just have an accountant. <laughs> it's a level of expertise. I've signed a line to say I've understood it, but really. So. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> okay, so, and, and because so that's in the ancient world. In medieval Europe, the only people who could read and write were the, basically the clergy. And that's where cleric, clerk, comes from. So clerks in holy orders and lay clerks were the people at the cathedral who could read and write. So the clergyman, the clerk, was the person in the village who you could reasonably expect he could read and write, or at least he had a very good memory and he'd memorise the prayer book. Okay? That's why he was the cleric, he was the clerk, he was the person in the village who could read and write, the only person in the village who could read and write. Even Lady Muck and Lord Cahoops probably couldn't read and write unless they had family that invested in that. Then in modern times, it all begins to change when the, um, the owners and the investors in the modern post-industrial world realised it was economically useful to have literate workforce. Suddenly, mass education, all the village kids had to learn how to read and write so they could work in the factory. And the classroom, instead of being um, Robert sitting down and tutoring me in the fine arts of music, because I'm a wealthy boy, the classroom becomes like a factory. Mm -hmm. Rows of children sitting at desks like they're going to be sitting at machines. And, and, and the, the mass education is the industrialization of education to prepare a workforce for that economic dynamic. Those people can read and write from the 19th century onwards, 18th century onwards. The question is, will they ever have any time or interest in reading and writing? given how they were basically worked or they dropped. So you can see how the, the creation of books, like the creation of beautiful art and music and fine arts, is, is a, a function for the privileged rather than a dynamic for the ordinary people. So the democratisation of literature, democratisation of the arts, 
um, and the dumbing down of the arts into entertainment okay, is a, a phenomenon to be aware of. And that, that continues, of course, with digital text and multimedia. So now if I'm reading them on my iPad and it says the Sea of Galilee, I can hold my finger on Sea of Galilee, up will come a map. I can click on a link and I'll actually see a video clip of somebody on a fishing boat on the Sea of Galilee. Couldn't do that with scrolls. Okay. All right, so, the wrap up. I want to focus, so we've... We've looked at the kind of the, the idea of being that the book functions in a special way for us as Christians. And not unlike, but different from the way it works for Jews and Muslims. We've talked about the idea of well, how do, who decides which books are sacred, have authority. And the short answer is whoever is in charge of the church at the time makes that decision. Okay, so uh, the people who wrote the 39 articles on, on, into at the command of the king, they wrote the definition of which books are to be in the Bible for Anglicans. Because it was came with royal authority. Okay. So now I want to think about some dynamics. I want to think about listening, arguing, and encountering. They're the three key words. Okay. So first of all, and primarily, the biblical texts were intended to be performed. They were basically a score, like a musical score, which some appropriately skilled musician is going to perform. And if, if I was um, Phoebe, the deacon who was sent to Rome with Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, my job would be to perform the letter to the Romans. I didn't take along photocopies and hand them out to everybody in the church. Okay. I arrived, I introduced myself, I had to validate who I was, that I was an authorised representative of the person who wrote the document. don't know how Phoebe did that, but that's what she would have had to do. And then she would have to perform the letter to the Romans. And people were used to, in an oral world, people were used to listening to a performance, whether it's Aristophanes or the letter to the Romans, they'd listen to the performance and then discuss it line by line afterwards. Because they, their mind was trained to do that. Now the text that Phoebe is reading from has no gaps between the words, no variation between upper and lower case and no punctuation. Just a string of letters. Okay, and she has to know it well enough that she can just perform it. Okay, so the text is really there as an aid to your memory rather than the text doesn't really exist until somebody performs it. So if Robert gives me a um, a musical manuscript, that's nice to have, but you know, what am I going to do with it? Okay, I can't just put it on the pew and think, well, that's going to work well for Sunday. Someone has to play that thing, interpret it, perform it, and so on. Okay, and practice and practice until they have the skills. So the Bible was never intended to be something we'd sit down with a copy on our lap and we'd go through phrase by phrase discussing what Paul meant by this choice of words rather than that choice of words. That's a very modern way of misusing the text. Then we have reading plans, because the most, if, you, if the Bible is to be listened to, you need to have a plan. You don't, don't want the priest to decide on Saturday night which reading you're going to have tomorrow. So lectionary is developed. In fact, there are something like 10,000 copies of the Greek New Testament and and more than 5,000 of them, possibly as much as 8,000 of them, are lectionaries rather than Bibles. Like our Gospel book or like the red book that sits on the lectern, that's a lectionary. It has excerpts from the Bible. So, so half to three quarters of all the ancient pre-printing press copies of the Bible that exist are actually lectionaries, not Bibles. Because that's how people used it. They didn't have a copy of the Bible, you know, which they carry around, but they did have a copy of the Psalms. They did have a copy of the Gospels. They did have a copy of Paul's letters or whatever. So that's how the Bible existed, as a basically a reading plan and selections put together as a reader. So this is this third point is saying that the lectionary is one of the most important ways that the Bible existed prior to the printing press. Because every monastery, every big church 
wanted to have a book of the Gospels. They all wanted to have a Psalter. And these were versions of the Bible. When we're listening to the Bible, what's it doing? Well, just like the stained glass windows, the Bible readings are shaping our spiritual imagination. We're entering into an imaginative world where there are demons and angels and gods and heroes and apostles and kings and tyrants and slaves and prophets and so on. And we learn, we learn how to... We learn how to live in that world. That world becomes where we live. And we interpret our outer world in relationship to that you know, spiritual world where we, we're here in church. And it provides us with a theological vocabulary. Uh, the Bible gives <coughs> us the, um, the terminology to use to think about faith, to think about God. Now, it can be good theology or bad theology, Healthy imagination or unhealthy imagination. Unhealthy imagination would be, oh, my baby has died and it wasn't baptised, it's going to go to limbo forever, it's never going to make it to heaven. <coughs> That's really bad theology, but it's shaped by the imagination that says, you've got to have your kid baptised, the sacraments are really important. Okay, so see, so I'm not saying it's a good thing, it's just, it's just how it is. The Bible shapes our spiritual imagination. So this is the Bible as, as um, a way of listening to the Christian faith. You know, tuning in to God's broadcast, as it were. Okay? Whether it's being performed orally, we're hearing it read in church, we're actually wealthy enough to be able to read for ourselves, but the Bible is a way of listening, of paying attention. This has nothing to do with arguments debates, whether Protestants are right and Catholics are wrong or the Seventh-day Adventists are kooky or nothing to do with that. It's just shaping our world. Like the fish in the, in the, in the, in the fish pond. The Bible is the bowl of water that we live inside. It's our world because it tells us what's going on. But of course, when there are real assets attached to religion, and when there's a capacity to have real power over other people's lives, then religion becomes an exercise in power as well. And you want to know who's in charge, who's making the rules, who has the authority. Okay. I'm resisting saying the dean. Okay, but yeah. who, who has the authority? Who's in charge around? Actually, it's the bishop, but anyway, who's in charge around here? Okay. So the Bible has always been used to resolve arguments. We see Paul doing that. Paul is getting into arguments with other Christians in the first century and he's using the Jewish Bible as part of the argument against them. Okay? So it goes way, way back to the very first generation of Christians. They didn't just listen to the Bible, they weaponized the Bible. And they used it as a weapon in theological debates. And when the, and that that's, doesn't matter that much when the church is a weird bunch of people who have no assets and have no status. But when the emperor becomes a Christian and the bishops are made um, basically powerful people in the empire, then, then there are real world consequences of people being exiled, murdered, burnt at the stake, etc., etc., because of differences over the Bible and over theology. So the Bible has tended to be seen by many, many people as a rule book. You want to know what to do, let's go and read the Bible, the Bible will tell us. Almost certainly it won't. And if you found something there, you can always find that other Bibles close said, no, it doesn't really mean that. It really means this, like Monty Python, you know, blessed are the cheese. Well, he means all makers of dairy products. It's not just <laughs> limited to cheese manufacturers, you know. That's a very clever spoof of the problem of how do you take a text which is locked in the past and make it relevant to a constantly evolving context in the present and the future? You need people like me. So it's often seen as a rule book. But actually, I don't like that example. I think it's more like a set of case studies than a book of rules. And there are two different ways, at least two different ways of doing law. 
you can just have a whole lot of examples, what's called case law. And most of our common law tradition is based on that. Well, in 1633, so-and-so versus the Crown, this was decided, that sets a precedent, you run with it. But in new circumstances, the judge can modify it. But if it's, if it's black letter law, then it's codified, and it's actually passed as laws, then it's prescriptive. It's not case law, it's prescription. A lot of people think of the Bible as God's, God's law book, as, as being legislation, prescription. I actually think it's more like a set of case studies, or as I used to say to my students, think of the Bible as a set of past exam papers. And they say, what's an exam? Well, when I was a kid, okay, I used to practice for an exam by looking at last year's year 12 exam papers, maybe the year before, and you try and work out the algorithm of when they're going to use that question in the third or fourth year and, and so on. But in other words, think of the Bible not so much as a set of black and white rules, but a whole lot of past exam papers or a whole lot of case studies where people of faith, people of goodwill, have tried to do the God thing in their own context. And while our context may be different, we're trying to do the same thing. So what can we learn from what they did? So you have a much less of a black letter approach to the Bible than some people would suggest. The other thing is the Bible itself is not a book of philosophical theological statements. It's a story. It's the story of the ancestors of Israel. It's the story of coming out of Egypt. Now, yes, there's, there's a whole lot of law in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, but even that body of law is set within the context of a story. These are the laws that God gave Moses when the children of Israel were camped at Mount Sinai. It's still, it's still set in the context of a story. You've got the prophets, and you've got the wisdom literature, and you've got the Psalms, and so on. These are not black letter documents. These are documents that invite us into discernment rather than telling us what to do. And But of course, over time, the temple disappears, animal sacrifice disappears, and you get the scholar, the Bible man, who's going to make it all clear for you. So the teacher becomes more important than the priest, and the book replaces the temple and the sacrifice. And, unlike a temple, the book is not tied to one location. As the people move around, the Bible goes with them. Whereas, if you're a Muslim, you've got to go back to Mecca. If you're Jewish, you've got to go back to Jerusalem. You've got the Bible, it's with you. It's on your phone, on your laptop, whatever. Yeah. And of course, particularly for the Northwestern European churches, and I keep stressing this, when we go on and on about the Reformation and the Protestant churches, it's only the top left quarter of Europe that we're talking about. It's not Eastern Europe. It's not Southern Europe. Okay? It's the northwest corner of Europe that breaks away from Rome at the time of the Reformation. Although <coughs> that's where most of our ancestors came from, that is not the world. It's just Northwest Europe. It just happens to be our cultural bubble. And for them, it was the Bible, not the Pope. Okay, the Catholics had the Pope, we had the Bible. Well, at least the Pope, you know what he's telling you, the Bible, of course. You've got to wait for the priest to tell you what the Bible means. Or every Protestant reads the Bible for themselves, and then you end up with a very fractured expression of Christianity. So listening to God, dealing with authority, and then I think actually most important is actually the scriptures as a sacramental encounter with God. Reading the Bible, listening to the Bible, engaging the scripture in some way is an intimate religious experience, relig intimate religious event. It's not simply a question of theological debates. Sometimes, sometimes we need that. Um, but, but there's way, way more to it, something much more personal, much more alive. And this gets us to the idea of the word of the Lord. In ancient Israel, the prophets would emerge and they'd say, hear the word of the Lord. And what they meant was, I've got a message for you from God and you're not going to like it. But listen up, sunshine. Okay? This is what you need to hear. 
In other words, there was an encounter with God which called us to account and invited us to recalibrate our lives, also called repentance and conversion. So there was this prophetic word coming from God and the experience of Jewish people and Christian people and Muslim people over the years is that our sacred text can be that kind of a document. Whether we're reading the Jewish scriptures and the Talmud, whether we're listening to the Quran, whether we're reading from the Christian Bible, listening to the text can be a, a way to encounter God. And an encounter with God also always has implicit in it, so what am I going to do about this? How will I modify my practice? How will I change my behavior, my outlook, my attitude because of this? In other words, reading the Bible is an invitation into a dialogue with the Spirit. And that's why I personally love the New Zealand Anglican Church, which doesn't say, hear the word of the Lord, or for the word of the Lord. Their line says, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. I think that captures very beautifully what the dynamic is when we're listening to Scripture. We're not saying this is a word from our sponsor. Okay, we're saying now there's something in here. I wonder what it is. I wonder what God is whispering in our ear that she wants us to listen to. That kind of dialogue, that kind of encounter, that kind of exploration is best done within the life of the community. Not privately, not by ourselves, not with a group of wacko online people who have really weird ideas, but the week by week, month by month, year by year, living out of the faith in a, in a particular local Christian community and saying, how do we read this stuff? Oh, you think it's saying that? You, not, surely you don't really think that. Surely it means more like this. And in that dialogue, and that's partly what the role of a sermon is, to try and stimulate some of that reflection on, so what might this mean for us at this time? Not what did it mean for the people in 1948, but what does it mean to people in 2018, whatever. Best done within the life of community. And I would be saying, as a Christian person, it's the gospel, which is the touchstone. One of the tests of whether I'm reading Bible correctly is, does this sound like Jesus? Does my way of interpreting the Bible sound like something Jesus would have done? Okay, he never drove a car and he didn't go to university and he probably couldn't play a church organ and so on. But, you know, it, does this kind of ring true? Does this cohere with the character of Jesus? So for me, the gospel trumps Paul. So, um, so we will, we'll end up with a kind of a theological touchstone hopefully coming out of scripture, which then becomes, we say, look, we can't really read it that way because that, in effect, that's too weird. That would take us to a place that would be unhealthy. Okay, So we're going to be bringing it back to kind of, so as, as Christian people, how does this sit with Jesus as we see Jesus in the Gospels? So for me, it's going to be Jesus first and Jesus last, which makes me sound very conservative all of a sudden. Okay. Let me finish with this refrain that we've been using in church quite a lot the last, particularly the last few weeks. And it's a, it's a, it's a gospel hallelujah that we're using, but it's, it's not just a nice piece of music. I think it's saying something fundamentally important. As we, as we prepare to listen to the gospel, we sing these words to ourselves. Hallelujah, the word of God is living. Hallelujah, gospel is among us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And that, to me, that's, that's where Scripture meshes in. It's, we're listening to God. We're, when Scripture is, out, is brought into the community, it's read and it's, it's um, unpacked in the sermon, then we're, we're looking to see the presence of God with us. So for me, Scripture becomes sacramental. It's not one of the seven sacraments of the church, but for me, it's a, it's a sacramental dynamic.